The trade deadline is in the rear view, and in front of the Atlanta Braves is the return of one Max Freed and a reunion with Dansby Swanson. Welcome into BPTV, Corey McCartney and Grant McCauley with you as always. And Grant, we start this episode with a confluence of events because on the heels of the August 1st deadline and what baseball's best team didn't do, I'm, you know, getting a starting pitcher or an outfielder, it's the vaunted like making a trade without making a trade because Max Freed is back in the fold. Yeah, it's a major upgrade for the Atlanta Braves rotation. And I would say, you know, all due respect to any jokes and tongue-in-cheek humor we have about the return and the trade that you didn't have to make because you already had somebody. Look at all the other contenders out there that were trying to get starting pitching, especially top-level starting pitching. They did not have Max Fried or a pitcher of that caliber coming back to them in the days following the trade deadline. In fact, they may not have had the pitchers that they're missing coming back at any time this year in the case of, say, the Texas Rangers and Jacob deGrom. But putting that aside, I mean, that was always, I felt like, part of the calculus for Alex Anthopoulos and for his, you know, his whole front office trying to find ways to upgrade this team. I do think that they, I'm certain, actually, that they went out and talked about a lot of deals that actually never happened. As you and I both know, that's not uncommon. But having Max Reed coming back is, I feel like, once you bolstered your bullpen, kind of the one-two punch that you really needed to help this club take that next step and get down the stretch, hopefully healthy and at full strength and maybe even a little bit stronger when you get Kyle Wright back in September, at least that's the plan. Yeah, we're gonna. I want to get into the expectations for free the rest of the way here in a second, but let's stay with the deadline uh, for a bit more here because there was no splash move. Obviously, the Braves did add lefty reliever Brad Hand, brought in some bench depth in the form of uh, Nicky Lopez, the latter for Taylor Hearn. Taylor, we barely knew ye. Uh, those after obviously getting Pierce Johnson the week before. We know that, as you mentioned, I mean, GM Alex Anthopoulos was checking in on starters, checking in on a righty bat for the outfield. No one's ever going to question his overturning every stone. Uh, especially for a club that's, you know, on pace for a hundred plus wins, the biggest division lead, if you take all the other division leads and combine them. But I yeah. think Grant, it's really a question of, did they do enough? And are there still in your mind, any perceived concerns with this team? I think the number one concern is always going to be what it is for every team and every player, every single game. And that is health. Can this club stay healthy when they get healthy when they get Max Fried back? Will he come back and perform the way that we expect him to? Because again, as I said, you know, a lot of other clubs out there would have loved to have had a player like this walking back in at this time of year to help them down the stretch drive. That is why I kind of get back to the question of did they do enough and think if Max Fried is healthy, yes, then I believe they've done enough. Then they've got Kyle Wright, who could be back in a month or so. They needed to strengthen the bullpen. They definitely did that with the two trades with Colorado. I do feel like Brad Hand doesn't have to be the guy that he was three, four, five years ago to be a serviceable lefty reliever and an option that could go along with A.J. Minter, who's back off the injured list, and Dylan Lee, who hopefully comes back very soon, to kind of start to give the Braves all of the weapons that they'll need in the bullpen to have the kind of success in October that they've had before because we know how big the, uh, of a weapon that the bullpen could be. So to make a long story short, if, the, if there are other clubs out there, other contenders that had the kind of players that the Braves did coming back at this time of year, already knowing that you've got a huge division lead and the best record in baseball, maybe they would have approached the trade deadline differently. But there were a lot of other teams, whether it was the Texas Rangers, the Houston Astros that went out and did their shopping on the big aisle and the big store to get those Mets aces and bring them back to the Lone Star State in the case of Verlander for the second time for Scherzer, just getting out of town with whatever's going on up in New York. That just is not where the Braves found themselves. So I guess the answer is, I think that they've done enough all year long to let you believe that if they get healthy with the guys that they already had, that there's still a next gear for this team. I think that's really what I'm getting at. Yeah, look, I think there's certainly some finger crossing when it comes to Kyle Wright coming back in September and not having any further issues because I think it's always a concern with a shoulder issue that's landed a guy on the injured list twice in the same season. I mean, obviously, look, Bryce Elder has a, a seven-plus ERA in the last month. He obviously did look a little bit sharper last time out against the Brewers. But in all, you've got a rotation that already has two all-stars in Spencer Strider and Elder and has been top 10 in the ERA with those two carrying a massive workload and potentially freedom right back with you – know, with, out a lot of innings on them already going into the postseason. So I get the stance in the rotation if the deal wasn't right. But the Braves are 22nd in way to run creative plus in left field, 20th in uh, DHF war. Obviously, that figures to put a lot of the struggles on Eddie Rosario and Marcelo Zuna. Travis Tarno has one start uh, at DH since June 2nd. Sean Murphy's last was May 10th. They could obviously be an answer at DH. Kevin Pillar could buy for some additional time and left. But I, I thought the Braves would make a play there. Anthopolis said they discussed it, but I really do think those are some areas where they could have at least used an upgrade. 
Yeah, maybe so. But I mean, you look up and down the Braves lineup and you look at, you know, the OPSs for all these players. I mean, what team has one through nine, the kind of numbers that the Braves do? Now, I obviously realized that, you know, there are some highs and lows that have been involved in both Marcelo Zuna and Eddie Rosario over the past couple of years and really longer than that for Marcel. But I do think that these are guys that maybe you start to look at different places in the order for them. Maybe there is another lineup shuffle that will be ahead of us at some point. Michael Harris, the second is so hot down in the nine spot. I know that one, you know, thought might be to not mess with it. Another thought might be to get that guy more plate appearances. So I'm, I'm not sure which camp I'm in. Maybe I'm in both. I'm just trying to figure out where I want to set up my tent, but you know, I, I don't necessarily feel like again, because of the overall power of this offense, that they were in a place of absolute necessity and they were in dire straits to make these upgrades I don't know what players were out there that the deals were talked about that they could have gone and gotten. I mean, a lot of people were pointing at the Cubs who were seeing this weekend. Oh, you should go get Cody Bellinger. Well, they didn't trade Cody Bellinger and they decided not to really trade away anybody. So maybe some of these obvious answers that might've been there when you played connect the dots prior to the trade deadline just didn't materialize in a way that made a lot of sense for the Braves. And I can also understand from here and Alex Antopoulos talked about it a few days ago, they weren't looking to absolutely clean out their farm for a couple of rentals. And that's not the difference in, Hey, are they all in or not all in? Is it world series or bust or not every year for the Atlanta Braves is world series or bust. It does not mean that they'll be able to make every single trade to bring in every single player, but they've already constructed an incredibly good roster. I think you kind of have to ride to some point with some of the guys you have and Ozuna and uh, particularly in Eddie Rosario. Those are guys that have contributed to this club in the past and have looked better this year. Do they have another run in them? And can they come up with the big hits at the right time? That seems to be the question that we're all going to find out together. Well, Friday's series opener for the Cubs, a return to the Max. Max Freed back on the mound for the first time since May 5th. Uh, his last time out for Triple A Gwinnetti threw 79 pitches, 49 of them for strikes over four and a third innings. That coming after he threw 65. I think the only person that can stop him from hitting 100 pitches at Wrigley Field is probably going to be Brian Snicker. But what are the expectations for Freed, not only Friday, but the rest of the way as he comes back from that forearm strain? He seems to feel confident that he has gotten over this injury and that it was not something that was going to be lingering and going to keep him down for the whole year. Obviously, there was concern when he initially did, you know, knowing that it was going to take a while being transferred to the 60 day IL. I think everybody started to maybe, you know, recalibrate what their expectations were going to be from him. But he has made steady progress. He made his rehab starts. He has reported no setbacks whatsoever. He seems to be ready to go. And I think that it might be one of those things where by not having to throw a bunch of innings the last three months, maybe get a little bit of a, a fresher Max Freed back down the stretch with a few extra bullets there as you you know look for the big games where you're going to get into some shootouts here and there. And it would be very nice to have this ace a little bit more rested up. I know that's something that you know you couldn't really predict what happened in 2022. I mean, Max Freed got sick. Spencer Strider heard an oblique. And just like that, the Braves starting rotation that had looked very, very, you know, vaunted and, and viable heading into October. It just wasn't that against the Phillies. But those are, again, the things that you can't really control. I mean, you, you've got one of the best pitchers in baseball, getting him back in there. I think it's going to be the expectation is that he comes in and does the things that the things that Max Fried knows how to do and has been doing for a number of years. And that's helped lead this staff. And I think he's capable of doing that. He's just got to stay healthy. And I know that's a big you know, what if or but so and so or but such and such has to happen. But I think that this is somebody that is worth betting on to do the things that you expect because he has shown in the past how important he can be in the big moments. Well, think about this. So you take a team that's already leading the majors in ERA plus at 119 across the entire staff at 6% ahead of the Astros. And you add last year's Cy Young runner up and, and weeks from now, we could be talking about adding last season's wins leader and right as well. But I just, I digress because if Max Freed is the Max Freed that's compiled an 8.8 .8 F4 over the past two seasons, which is ninth best among all starters. And with the way Spencer Strider's pitching and looking like a Cy Young contender himself, I don't know, Grant, that there may be a better one-two punch in any rotation, even with Max Scherzer going to the Rangers and Justin Verlander joining another contender in the Astros. Yeah, I agree. And then you back him up with what is one of the best offenses in all of baseball. And it's not the Braves are not just looking at one particular group to carry them. They really can have all the makings of a great starting rotation, of a much stronger, much healthier bullpen. I mean, health is a big factor in both of those. And they do have this great lineup with an MVP candidate at the top. And then as you go down, you might have an MVP candidate batting cleanup right now. You might have an MVP candidate in the ninth spot if Michael Harris continues to not make outs for the next couple of months. I don't know. But, you know, you look at it up and down. There's a lot of different contributors on any given night 
you needed the pitching. And I feel like you had an in-house option that, again, a lot of other clubs would have loved to have had somebody like Max Fried to come back at this time. And I do think if you start to stack them up and you look at what Strider's done this year, I think Charlie Morton has had a better year than maybe some people do. I think he's been far better than not, and he's been better than last year, certainly. If that's your number four or number five starter, depending on how you view what's going on with Bryce Elder and where exactly it is Kyle Wright factors into all of this, the Braves have got a lot of answers in their rotation when it's a very, very pivotal time to have those options, and they very well, with a healthy Max Free, could be exactly where they want to be at the exact right time of the year to get there. Well, Freed is obviously the top storyline as the Braves hit Wrigley Field for three games, but a very close second is taking on Dansby Swanson for the first time as a Cub. Uh, on a team that's red hot, they've won eight of the last 10. Swanson goes into a meeting with his old team, uh, red hot as well. He has an OPS over 1,100 over this 10-game stretch. Six homers, he's driven in 14. Uh, there's obviously going to be a ton of focus on the short stops on both sides of this series from a Braves perspective. Uh, you know, it, it's it's Swanson and Orlando Arcia. Obviously, the aftermath of watching Swanson leave for Chicago. Arcia signed for a deal that has him under control through 2026. Grant, how is Braves country feeling at the position as it goes into seeing its old shortstop on Chicago's north side? I think you got to be feeling pretty good about what Orlando Arcia has done this year. And if you were wondering how Braves country feels about Orlando Arcia, well, they voted him in to start the National League All-Star game. So I'd say it's a pretty good indicator of exactly what Braves fans have been feeling this year. Arcia, I don't think anybody was expecting him to bat 340 and hit 25 home runs or, or any of the crazy things that you know, maybe the stats early on look like, but it was nice to see him come out of the gate and really hit the ground running. He has continued to play a very steady shortstop. He can provide the power, the big hits. I mean, he's just a great all-around player. I mean, the one thing he can't do is run very fast. We found that out a couple of times, but I'm not going to knock the rest of the game. It's been extremely good. The Cubs, meanwhile, they ponied up. They spent a lot of money on Dansby Swanson to help try to turn that franchise around some. And, you know, if you believe their recent hot streak, Maybe they feel like they've got a run in the National League Central or a run at the wild card at the very least. We'll see how both of those pursuits play out. I think a lot of things have to go right for the Cubs in that regard. Maybe less has to go right to win the Central, honestly, than to get into some of the wild card spots, depending on how it all plays out. But Dansby Swanson is going to be a critical part of the success that they have. At least that's the plan for it. You know, he had some great moments in Atlanta, some big home runs, some big hits, and was part of a World Series winner. I think that's a pretty nice legacy, but I feel like Braves fans, for the most part, can say, hey, thank you. We appreciate that. All those are great memories. That video clip can play forever, and we can go on about the business of trying to win another one. And Orlando Arce is going to be the guy that they're riding with, at least in 2023 and maybe for the next couple of years, to help them get that done. So right now, Swanson hitting 2% better than RC, a 118 weighted run create a plus at 116. He's 1.4 F4 better than the Braves new starting shortstop. But RC, a fourth among all shortstops and average of Swanson's t uh, 12, also leads him in OPS, though Swanson does have him in slug. He's play has one fewer multi-hit game, 26 to 27, despite playing in nine fewer games. Then there's the fact that Swanson's contract, I mean, obviously 170 million more. I don't think anyone could have forecasted a season that would have see Arcia be the NL starting shortstop, as you mentioned, the all-star game. But in terms of bang for the buck grant with the Braves paying just under a million per F war that RC has delivered so far compared to 6.5 million per war for Swanson. I mean, this is, it's, it's an absolute insane bargain what they're getting for the dollar for Arcia. It is. I mean, it's a bargain and it's also performance. So, and uh, sometimes pe people feel like those things are mutually exclusive. I'm here to tell you that, you know, and we can see with some of the Braves deals, like they identify value and they go out there and they try to get the deal done to keep it around for a while. And that's not a knock on Dansby Swanson. I'm sure the Braves under other terms would have liked to have had him hang around for a bit, but he had a career year walking into a market that was very favorable for shortstops. But as you look around at some of those deals, whether it's his Bogarts, Trey Turner and Carlos Correa, you know, I don't know if that's what I'd want to be doing for the next 10 or 11 years for a lot of other teams or for at least three other teams. Dansby got himself a good deal at a good age, and you know maybe he's going to be able to continue to be the player that he's been the last four or five years for the Braves. Cubs will certainly take that, and good for him for being able to cash in and and get that deal. But you know the Braves have identified value more to the point, and Orlando Arcia was somebody that whether it was you or me or anybody else might have thought kind of had a limited role here. You know at at its best, they figured out that he could be a little bit more than that, and I'm happy to sit back and say. I didn't call that one, but I'm happy to be wrong about it. I'll put it that way. I wasn't trying to be too hard on him, but a lot of people thought Von Grissom was going to get the first crack at shortstop this year, and then maybe you end up at Orlando Arcia at some point. That just wasn't the way that it went, and there's a lot of confidence, obviously, 
with the Braves as an organization from the top down to the coaches and obviously the teammates. Everybody seems to love what Orlando RC is bringing every single day in addition to what he does on the field. I mean, it just seems to be the kind of fit that, you know, you, you look for it all over the field and, and and all up and down the roster and the Braves have one in that shortstop. And it's, you know, as Freddie Gonzalez used to say, good for him and good for us. Well, this is the first meeting of the Braves and Cubs this season. Swanson's return to Atlanta, which is obviously going to come with its own emotions for sure, isn't until September 26th, which is the next to the last series of the regular season. So we're going to run this all over again here in a little over a month. Yeah, there you go. All right, this will do it. That'll do it for this edition of BP TV. But before we uh, dip out here, make sure that you subscribe, turn on those notifications, and like a good game of telephone when we were kids, make sure you pass along the word to uh, get this show growing. Until next time, I'm Corey McCartney. He's Graham McCauley, and we'll see you soon, Braves Country.